Hi, good morning, Steve. Good morning, Mel. How are you today? Do you have a good weekend? Yeah, very good. Welcome to the Vehicle Network podcast. And you are our third, third guest that we've um, that we've had on. We've had a little bit of a break, and that's just due to some um, lo- logistical reasons, really. But we're, we're back up and running and back with a bang. Um, no pressure to you um, for coming on this uh, reignition of the Vehicle Network podcast. And you're, we... you're an ex-policeman. I've got to trust you, haven't I? <laughs> But I know it's um, good to see you, and um, um, it's good that we've kept in contact because we first met each other, gosh, seven years ago. Yeah, I think yeah, I came I to slightly you. before that. I just left the police and yeah. um, heard you at a, a presentation and up in uh, Bradford, of all places. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, like, it was like an IMI talk or something, wasn't it? That's I right. Yeah, and, and when I started Volvo, sorry, when I first started Volvo like nine years ago, for the first. Three or four years, I was doing a lot of those. I am yeah. I, I A E A. Anyone who asked me to go and talk, there's an opportunity for me just to get out there and raise awareness as to what I was doing. And more to the point, you know, I know we're going to talk a lot about this, but safe repair, you know, doing yeah. things the right way. So, um, it was, uh, we had a good conversation that night, and it's been good to uh, keep in contact with you. It did because I was interested, obviously, in the main topic of the presentation that you did, but also we had a common interest in football, and yeah. uh, we'll perhaps talk about that during the uh, during the podcast. But um, thank you for keeping in touch with us, and thanks for for speaking well, to me on the occasions that we have um, we have sort of dipped back in and, and spoken to one another. Um, and, and I really want to, you know, open people up to Steve Plunkett of, of Volvo and Polestar, really, because you are, um, you know, a, an industry. Stalwart, shall we say, in respect to saying. I'm uh, an ancient, ancient, is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> um, around the repair industry and, um, you know, um, body and paint programs that I know you're involved with at the moment. So if you want to just tell the listeners a little bit about that um, current role that you're in and the backdrop to how you got there, I guess. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I've been at Volvo just literally over nine years and the objective is to... Well, the objective was to develop an approved network of body shops <clears throat> um, that are obviously compliant to our brand program standards. And yeah, that includes like lots of training, technical training, non-tech training, products training, um, obviously making sure the body shops have got the right tooling and equipment, um, yeah, all, all the things you'd kind of expect a manufacturer approved network to um, to have in place. And you know, we don't... We, we don't sit still. We, we're, next year, we're looking to bring in some management um, business leader courses into the network to help the body shops, manage body shop managers, aspiring managers, and the MDs, GMs, and business owners to, you know, hopefully make make sure that they're in, they're in a good place or, and, uh, yeah, just provide them with as much support as possible. But, you know, when we started nine years ago, we had 137 body shops on our list. Yeah. Uh, currently, we have 72. And, uh, you know, it's very nice, very flattering, but we get approached. There's not many weeks go by where we don't get a call or a message, an email from a body shop wanting to be Volvo approved. But when I first started, um, it was kind of apparent that the body shops that were working with us weren't really seeing many Volvos. And therefore, most of them were looking to leave the network because they weren't getting a return on investment. Because yeah. there should be no shame. And actually, I'm very proud now that we've got a reduced network that, you know, can cover GB for us. And they're repairing more cars. I mean, pre-lockdown, we repaired just under 9,000 Volvos in the network compared to 2,500 in 2012 across, like I said, double the amount of sites, really. So, you know, we've shown significant significant growth. And it's really important that if we want to, well, it's really important initially to make sure that we align ourselves to the right the right body shop partners and that we've got a strong relationship with them and um you know those that have come on the journey and stuck with us and m- most of them have we don't really get many change much change in the network um these days as far in but you know i, I could say it with a degree of confidence that if you speak to a volvo body shop now they're they're really really pleased to be working with us and they get they see a good amount of volvos so yeah, yeah it's it's yeah, all about customer retention, really. That's the core objective to get as many Volvo customers in the approved network for um, a guaranteed Volvo repair. And I haven't mentioned really Polestar, but 
we're now sort of tagging Polestar in on the end of that because it's obviously still quite a new product, but we're now putting the Polestar network in place. And I think it's like 87% of the body shops have decided to, to come along with the Polestar journey as well. So, yeah. um, so that's good. Yeah. So customer retention is key, making sure we were doing the right things to get as many Volvo Polestar customers in the approved network um, for what I believe is the, the right repair, the best repair opportunity. And, and also that customer experience, you know, we, for me, you know, if the customer's getting their car repaired in our network, then it's just a given really that they're going to get a, a good experience and a good quality repair. In yeah. fact, um, through our Volvo car insurance partner, Verex, the last four and a bit years, uh, we've won a FIFO award for consistently high standard, consistent high standard of repair and consistent um, uh, customer journeys, you know. So yeah. um, when I met you, Noel, back in the day, I would have been saying about this is what we're building and this is where we're going. Yeah. And now, now I can sit back and sort of get off my soap, well, I'd say sit back. There's not a lot of sitting back goes on, but no. um, now I can actually kind of get off my soapbox a bit is what I'm trying to say. I don't need to preach so much about the benefits of the approved network because no. people in the industry know, um, you know, you speak to a work provider and they'll tell you that the customer or mutual customer has had a good good experience. Um, they know they can put a job with Travolvo, Stroke Polestar, Body Shop, and the customer's going to be happy. Yeah, and that's of vital importance for some yeah. of the things that we're going to talk about going forward. Mm -hmm. And speaking of awards, did I not see you um, take an award recently? I did, on yes. I'm yeah. now a knight. I'm an industry knight. So <laughs> ABP, ABP club. I get a free horse, apparently. I'm still waiting for that to turn up. <laughs> Those sorts of things, you know, are testament, I guess, to the dedication that you give to your role and, and you know, and they're rightly recognised for, for that. And the amount of work that you've done over the last nine years to get to where you're at is, you know, testament to, you know, to, to, to what you're doing and, and to receiving those awards. So, yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's, you know, we're not... Um, we're not speaking to somebody that doesn't really care. You really care about, you know, what, what you do. And that's reflected in, in those sorts of activities yeah, that you right. talk about there. So what got you to that point then, Steve, um, of joining Volvo? Where's does your history in the... There was one before that. Montreux. So, right, um, quick... Um, Briefly. Break. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, one of the things of being really ancient is that obviously you've got quite a long career of doing different things. But look, I started in the industry... My dad had a garage, basically, used car sales, bit of mechanical work, odd little bit of panel and paint. I did mechanics for a year and I absolutely hated it. I'm mean, Still now I'm not interested in mechanics or engines. Um, but just started working for him in, when I was 15, my last summer holiday, to see, you know, if I liked that. Yeah. And and I did. I really enjoyed uh, that. And like a lot of young people at that age, I enjoyed actually earning some money. And yeah. um, so I started doing the apprenticeship and yeah, after a year, um, my dad sort of realized I didn't really like the mechanic side. So we started doing more paint and, and body like so panel and paint. And uh, yeah, I just took to it really. And I think I was pretty decent at it, did an apprenticeship and worked at a few body shops because um, my dad got took ill, so I had to pack his body shop up or his business up, unfortunately, after about 18 months. And then, yeah, finished my apprenticeship, um, City and Guilds and started to get at the age of about 25 started to dabble a little bit in you know looking back it wasn't really proper body shop management but it's like estimating and yeah. small body shops so you deal with customers and stuff like that and then at the age of 27 i went to work for bsf um paints on the rm brand um so i was a painter in a suit and that was like the dream job at the time to be honest with you I always say that yeah but as a paint spray you know you, a lot of painters want to work for a paint company and have you like your spray gun kit and stuff? So I did that for three years and then went to work for a dealer um, and sort of did parts as a business development manager. Then I got into body shop management, proper body shop management. Yeah. And then spent five and a half years. I was there for about a year doing the body shop manager role and then went to work for a company called East Billy Coach, who works as a body shop manager and then kind of ended up in this arena, really. Um, 2000, I went for, work for a company called Carter & Carter on the Toyota Lexus Body and Paint program and worked for them sort of nearly 10 years, worked across different brands. 
And so I've kind of been in this role, yeah, 22 years, or this this environment, if you like, yeah, 22 years come January. Yeah. And um, yeah, the, what really appealed to me about the Volvo job um, 10 years ago, um, when it first got run by me, was that it was almost a blank sheet of paper, and it was mine to sort of like make good. And um, so yeah. I'm still here and uh, we've had a lot of successes like you touched on. You know, it's not just about me. I mean, it's very nice winning that award last month. But as I tried to say on the night, um, you know, it's about working with some great people yeah. around you as well. Um, Absolutely. So, but so, yeah, it's on the technical side and obviously a bit more on the non-technical side the last 20 um, or so years. Yeah. I'm glad you've I'm glad you've um, detailed that um, sort of plot of history and, and, and how far back it goes because when, you know when you Google Steve Plunkett, do you know the first person that comes up? Um, I think it could be a rock star. <laughs> yes, and that's not that's not me. But um, <laughs> when, when I worked in the Vauxhall dealer about 1992 ish, this um, young lad came in one lunchtime. He'd been out in town doing a bit of shopping. He bought this like rock anthem CD. And he said, look, look at this, look, 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 you're famous, like Steve Plunkett, my attitude. <laughs> my attitude. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not really my sort of stuff, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm big into music, which we'll probably come on to in a bit. But, yeah, Steve yeah. Plunkett, my attitude, yeah. not, really, not really my type of um, thing, to be honest with you. A bit too heavy rock for me. Yeah, yeah he's the first person that comes up, is he? A, a band called um, Autograph, yeah. Yeah, but maybe maybe people will want your autograph. I don't know. I doubt it. <laughs> um, but if you do dig a little bit deeper on Google, then we get into the likes of um, Steve Plunkett and the All Stars. So I yeah. really don't want to let the opportunity go by mm -hmm. without just having a brief chat around the work that you've done um, for a lot of charities and um, your association and affiliation with Norwich City, I guess. Um, from yeah. From an early age, if I, if I remember. Well, I've been, I've been supporting Norwich of 59. I've been, I went to my first game when I was eight. I was actually a Chelsea fan. Well, I thought I was, like a lot of young kids. <laughs> then, I, then I went to, I had a Chelsea watch and stuff like that. Um, Peter Benetti gloves. But then I went to a Norwich game and that was it, really. I, can't, I think I kind of clocked early doors that I was probably not going to go to watch Chelsea very often, if at all. Yeah. But, you know, support, support my local team and... Um, luckily, at the time, they were doing really well. So, uh, yeah, you know, I've been a Norwich City fan all, all that time. And like you, know, Noel, I know, you know, you're a Huddersfield Town fan, a Terriers fan, and <laughs> you, you know you know all about the role of coaster rider support in a club like Huddersfield. Yeah, Norwich. absolutely. Um, but, yeah, I'm not a season ticket holder. I was up until about five years ago, but as kids, the kids stopped sort of wanting to go, um, I just sort of, I'm a casual fan now. But, um I've I've just um, as I mentioned to you off air this season, um, I've lived between Norwich and Kings Lynn, so it's about twenty five miles either way. I am um, I've just become stadium announcer at Kings Lynn this season, so it's a vol voluntary role, like pretty much everybody that works at the club. And they're they're in the National League, if you don't know, down the bottom at the moment, but hopefully things will improve. So I'm doing that on a match day. Yeah, and, uh, really, really uh, enjoy it. Great club, brilliant, yeah. and. Uh, uh, just they're just finding it hard this season because yeah. of that the money that's available. You know, there's a lot of teams like Rex, the Mex Football League teams in there that have got a lot of money. And uh, you know, Lynn has gone first full time pro, first time this season. Yeah. So it's it's difficult. Um but yeah, keeping on track um uh with the Plunkies All Stars. So this is a charity football team that I set up. We played our first game in 2014. We've played about I'm gonna say about nine games and uh we, we, we are, we're up for playing against anyone, but the main event is normally sometime at the end of May, we'll play at a professional ground as uh, so we pay to hire it. And yeah. we don't do it for charity. We've raised uh, just over £46,000 um, to date for different charities, as you highlighted. We do, did it for Anthony Nolan this year, and we raised, I think it was around about 16000 quid, yeah, and, which was incredible because the previous game, we'd raised £7,200. Yeah. I think this year, everyone, well, I think people want to be associated with it, which is very nice and very flattering. But I think uh, also last year, people because we didn't get out much, people actually were quite happy to throw us some money this yeah. year. 
Yeah. Obviously, the challenge is going to be in 2022 um, is to try and get over that 16, 17,000 pounds. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll have a go. We're going to uh, do it for brain cancer research. And we've, already, right. we've already got 1,800 pounds on the Just Giving page. So if, yeah. you, if anyone wants to give us some money, they yeah. can contact me. But if they Google um, Plunky's All Stars Just Giving, it should hopefully come up and it's the brain yeah. cancer research page right. so, but and it's just a load of mates and associates really you know that we all like playing football still yeah. and age group is anything from sort of 18 up to probably our oldest players about 65 sometimes right. so and, if we've got uh, any listeners that are part of a football team that want to take on the punky all-stars yeah, then yeah get in contact and we'll see we'll see and, what we can do yeah, and, that, and that's a you know that's a genuine offer. I know that you know this. It, it's it's a great thing that you do, and to, to be able to play at a, you know a proper stadium. Oh, that's incredible! It's yeah, not an opportunity that, that you know comes by for many people. So yeah, yeah. If people are interested in that. Then by all means, get in touch with Steve or like you said. Yeah, um, yeah, please do. And more importantly, give us some money, even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I would we'd welcome that. So I guess. Um, why we wanted to speak to you today on the vehicle network really is to discuss, you know, these modern vehicles that are going into repair shops and the sort of current technologies that are on, not just Volvo and Polestar vehicles, you know, we are moving into a phase of autonomous and connected vehicles. Um, And I guess it's the importance of that repair process. If those vehicles are involved in crashes or, or damaged as a result of, um, you know, criminal damage, um, how does that repair process, you know, affect the future life of that vehicle if then it's back out on the roads to protect people? Yeah. Um, mm. Can you tell us a little bit about that process for the approved, you know, body shop um, repair centre versus yeah. somebody that isn't, and and some of the you know pitfalls, I guess, of of not of the vehicle not going through that process. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll maybe without being too contentious, or maybe that the listeners decide what they think is best, um, if you like. But I, I think that it's best for a Volvo Strat Polestar to be repaired um, in the approved network because, again, we've got the trained technicians, we've got the skill sets, we've got the standards, you've got the familiarity of yeah. the body shops repairing those Volvos more than, if you like, a generic body shop that's approved for many different brands or maybe for many different work providers. But... Yeah, we know we've put the training in. Um, obviously, we're moving towards electric vehicle. Um, it's already here, isn't it? But this yep. year, as we try and recover from lockdown and able to, we're able to actually put some training in uh, to the network. Uh, to start things off, we've got it that a minimum of one person needs to be a trained Volvo EV technician. And moving forward, probably once we get to the back end of next year and We've got all the network with one one that one dedicated um, Volvo EV specialist expert. Uh, we'll open up to the network to have more than one. Because I mean, ultimately, all technicians in the body shops or network are going to need to know about a Volvo or a Polestar, aren't they? Because we are, we've always got to aspire to be the best and the right people yeah. to prepare those cars. And we, I think, more than ever, well, there is. Um, there's more awareness and maybe more interest in our network now from work providers than there ever has been. Yeah. I think um, I mean, one of the things I set out to do when I started nine a bit years ago was to engage with the insurance and the work provider sector. Because I think in, in the past, we've always had this vehicle manufacturer, body shop, and then insurance sector, almost like a bit, a bit aggy with each other. And I think it's really important that we break down those barriers and we've worked really, really hard to do that. Again, like we said at the start of the conversation, like when I was jumping in my car, going to some random places on a freezing cold Tuesday, February evening um, to do a talk. It was all part of the plan to just break down some barriers and engage with people so they can see that that we're actually, we're not too bad as vehicle manufacturer or we're not anyway. No, we want to have, we want to have a conversation. We want to, raise awareness to the technology and the hope that people, companies are going to actually look to put more Volvos and Polestars back in our network. I mean, I had a situation a few months ago where one of our body shops in the Northwest called me up 
and said they'd had a call from a non-approved body shop about a Polestar. This body shop had been sent a damaged front end Polestar, quite a heavy hit. And the body shop in question was really concerned about whether they were able, competent to repair this car or not. And so our body shop advised them that, that they'd, they'd be happy to take the job off them or yeah. really they should consider X, Y, and Z. That body shop didn't want to go back to their work provider and um, and say, you know, look, we don't feel we can repair this car. So they carried on repairing it. So I, I don't think that's the best course of action. No. Especially if the body shop is nervous around repairing that vehicle. Could lead to all sorts of problems, couldn't it? Um, yeah. You know, we, at ABP the other week, we um, talked to uh, Dean Lander from Thatcham, talked about, you know, making sure not just that the cars are repaired correctly and safely, but that our technicians in our workshops are safe uh, repairing these electric vehicles. So that's, from our point of view, you know, while we're doing the training on EV, bespoke Volvo, well, we need to make sure that we've got that awareness in the body shop so our technicians are safe, but we also want to aim to make sure that these cars are repaired correctly and safely. So we're, we're always looking at um, different things we maybe need, or what do we need to add into the standards next? It's not a case of just adding something into standards for the sake of it. It's just making sure always that we're ahead of the curve. You know, we, we've got a meeting next week where we're going to be looking at standards, the current standards, and maybe tweaking, adding one or two things in that need to go in, like at the back end of December, ready for next year. Yeah. Yeah, we've, uh, I'm really, really proud of the network that we've built. We, we work yeah. with some fantastic people, and we, we, we're not very, we're not onerous with our costings. We only put costings for training, tuning and equipment in if it needs to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, again, I think our body shops recognise that. Yeah. That we we don't just lo load stuff up. We we only put things into standards um, that that are relevant. So, yeah. Yeah. That was a good. We do. We do. We've been quite well. We've we've been, had a bit of success in the last few years where we've been doing some work with Gavea Insurance and um, and NFU Mutual. Okay. Um, they put Volvos in our network for repairs. And, yeah. Uh, you know, cars over a certain age, predominantly cars over 2015, because that was when we launched XC90, XC60, the SPA platform and the CMA platform vehicle. So there's an understanding and appreciation that these cars are a bit more high tech and we yeah. should get them in the Volvo network. And, uh, you know, if you speak to the, speak to those guys, I think they would tell you that they like what they get from the Volvo network. They, yeah, yeah. They see that the body shops are keen to take the repair, and they yeah. see they see that the uh, customers have been treated correctly. So there's no complaints from that side, yeah. and uh, that the repair quality is very high standard. Yeah, yeah. There's a good couple of points I wanted to pick up on the uh, on there. Um, one, electric vehicles and the um, you know, I don't say problems, but the industry at the moment, um, I think, would acknowledge that there is a lack of trained personnel to deal with. You know, electric vehicles at the rate at which they're, you know, being introduced and starting to, um, you know, take over the, the what take over the market immediately. But obviously, with the government's goal to get everything electric, then um, there seems to be people either from the manufacturer level, yep, they've got the staff and they've got the training, but the rest of the, um, you know, industry seems to be lacking a little bit in that. And I would say that from a personal point of view, from a vehicle system forensics examiner, that, you know, how many people that we that do our sort of jobs have got an awareness around electric vehicles and in the emergency services about first responders dealing with emergency, uh, with electric vehicles as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that it's, it's, you know, it's a massive area in itself um in in all different aspects of the automotive industry yeah the, the minute the minute that car is involved in an accident it needs to be handled in the right way doesn't it yeah absolutely uh, yeah. and that somebody from a crime scene examiner like myself to somebody in a repair shop that's going to be dealing with that and and obviously that's one of the reasons and one of the standards that, that's in there and the other interesting thing i think is around um you know a non-approved center trying to do a repair and there's a couple of things in that for me. One is, as human beings, we don't like to acknowledge the fact that we might have to utilize somebody else to help us out because we, yeah. you know, we, 
as humans, we don't like sort of failure to a degree. Um, and, and that can be, be classed as that. But when I know of instances, you know, that can be occurring like that, then for me as an investigator of either a serious crash, hmm. um, whether it's a fatality or, or, a, or an injury, serious injury, um, how do I know, you know, I, I need to learn about the history of that vehicle. And if I know it's been involved in a minor bump, you know, three months earlier, mm. and it's not gone through the proper repair process, what implications could that have then on, you know, the crash that I'm dealing with as to whether or not it was operating properly? And I think over recent times, our mm. industry around investigations has sort of said, you know, it's not the vehicle at fault. It's the, um, you know, it's the driver error. Nine, you know, over 90% is, is attributed towards the driver. But I think unless people are making proper investigations, there is a chance that the technology might not be right. And that's not from the manufacturer's perspective. It will be manufactured to a degree, not with a caveat that there might be some erroneous um, you know, malfunction somewhere. But if we've not had trained personnel to repair a, you know, a vehicle to the right standard, then it could well be um, you know, an error. We, we talked a little bit about that with uh, James Wales, who's an Audi motor technician going through some of those recalibration processes of the yeah. ADAS. Yeah, that's like right. If, if, like you say, if something's not been recalibrated correctly. Yeah. I know when we launched XC90, like six almost, yeah, six and a half years ago, um, there was a fantastic video at the time, and it you know, just pointed to all the different senders, uh, sensors, sorry, and uh, radars, lidars around the car, and it was like, oh, this is like game changing. Yeah. Um, they, talk, they were talking about, like, you know, onboard aircraft technology yeah uh, you know it was a game changing for us when we looked yeah. at 90 because all all the product thereafter has got that kit in it yeah you know but i think i think a lot of people look at our xc90 and say look that is the product that we need to be careful of but yes true but actually all the other cars we've launched since then have got that same that's kit right in, yeah um, and I think, I think certainly with the volvo brand you know um they are you know, it, it, they are one of one of the global leaders in vehicle safety, if not yeah. the global leader in vehicle safety. With the you know the seatbelt being introduced and no yeah. pedal being put on on that, the probably one of the first to introduce um, pedestrian protection and side impact yeah. and what have you. And I know because we've spoken previously around the work that goes on in that research and the facilities that you know that you know they have over in Sweden for that. That it, that it is important that. You know, the brand is protected by yeah. the correct repair procedure um, when vehicles are involved in, in collisions and going forward. And yeah. Yeah. and as they will continue to strive for that, um, I think that the, you know, vision zero that no one will be killed or seriously injured in a Volvo from yeah. 2020 onwards. Mm. Um, I think that's um, a little bit ambitious in some regards in the sense that sometimes it can be nothing to do with a vehicle. It's, it's just the circumstances. Yeah. But in order to maintain those standards that, that the brand sets, that it is important that they have people in positions where you are to influence the correct procedures around. Yeah, the that's, that's absolutely spot on. Yeah, yeah, that, that was indeed the statement, wasn't it? That nobody will killed or seriously injured by 2020 in a, in a new Volvo. But like you say, it's spot on. I take this bit really seriously. That's why we need to make sure that our cars, our customers' cars, are repaired correctly and safely in the network. But obviously, we can only control the cars that are repaired in our network, can't we? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Once it, goes, uh, yeah. Once it goes out and through other other channels, then you've no con you've no control over mm -hmm. that, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but if we consider we're at twenty twenty one now, those cars would be out there, and these cars are now at an age whereby they're getting involved in incidents and Absolutely. starting to be put yeah. through, um, you know, put through networks or, or gone through mm -hmm. a number of different owners mm -hmm. um, at these times. And the other point I'd just pick up on is, you know, the quality management systems around that training. And I think it's interesting to to speak to somebody else in a completely, albeit in the same industry, but we deal with quality management systems for, you know, for the work that we do. And, you know, it, it's interesting just to pick up on a couple of points whereby you constantly look and refine those and that they're not set in stone and you don't have things in there that don't need to be in there. Mm -hmm. um, but, they, but they are... Um, constantly sort of reviewed and assessed given the changes that the automotive yeah. you know, yeah. industry is going on at the moment. So how does that quality management system get, you know, get flooded out? Is it a result of feedback from the centers as to what, or is it, a, you know, side research or is yeah. it uh, yeah. on the manufacturer themselves? 
Well, yeah, well, I mean, when, when we launch a new vehicle, uh, inevitably, uh, you know, you'll get, when we launched XC40, you know, you kind of think, okay, I wonder how long it's going to be before someone's on on the phone saying, oh, I've got an XC40 in, and there's maybe no methods on ad text yet um, for the first couple of months. That, that's always a bit of a challenge, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, maybe what looks like a sill section needs to go in that car, but actually you, you have to buy like the whole body side. So, that, you know, we're always feeding back to Volvo if, if we, or when we get like cases like that, you know, you know, is this, is this really the right thing to be doing to put an aside in the car? Cause actually it just on the face of it, it just looks like it needs a sill. So we have a, uh, something called a tie report that the body shops or the dealers can fill out and send back to Volvo to give them feedback on things. And, that uh, you know, hopefully that goes back to the people in uh, Gothenburg where they can look at it and maybe, maybe reconsider yeah. um, what, what needs to, uh, to be done. Yeah, it's important, I think, to listen to those people on the shop floor and to take, you yeah. know, to take that feedback, you know, to take that feedback and be actively, um, you know, doing something about it around, um, you know, these are the practitioners that are dealing with these things on a daily basis. I expect they'll be yeah. receiving that from a, you know, from a global audience um, yeah. to a degree of body shops and what have you, and they'll have to make the right decisions at their end. But it's good to know that there's a communication protocol in place for those things to, you know, to be fed back um, because it does. It, you know, it could, it could potentially save lives or save time and save money in the long run for those people that are having to be, um, be experienced by putting the vehicle through, you know, that process in what, whatever form they're in, whether they be a, you know, a customer at the end of it who's, who's had a vehicle damaged or the body shop themselves running it on a, on a daily basis. So, We've got, we've got an accident investigation team in Sweden as well. Um, met somebody from that team on one of my trips over to Sweden a few years ago. And so... Certainly in Sweden, I think beyond maybe into Norway, they um, they kind of get called to any Volvo accident to like research and you know identify what's happened, what's gone wrong, why has it gone wrong, is there something that we can improve on? Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, that was a great presentation from those guys when, when we were yeah. over there a few years ago. Yeah. That, that, that's interesting and, and and it's good that a manufacturer does engage in that side of things to be honest because um certainly here in the uk the, there are talks um going on at the moment to have like a national road collision investigation branch uh, similar to air investigation and rail investigation they are looking at that for for transport and it would be interesting to get if that does ever get off the ground to get manufacturers input around the vehicles that have been involved in those real life incidents mm -hmm. um, rather than testing labs because you can run as many scenarios as you want in a lab but from personal experience i know that you're never going to be able to recreate what goes on in you know in some of the live instance instances yeah. that, that these vehicles are involved in so mm -hmm. um to know that they're already um you know doing that anyway would be something that I would certainly project um, forward in a consideration for those to link in it if, if, if ever that does get over the, off the ground in the UK. Yeah. Well, like you say, in real life accident situations, there's all sorts of things that happen, isn't there? You know, yeah. Um, yeah. Bizarre ways that, um, that accidents uh, happen. Just yeah. Two seconds, Mel. Yeah. No worries. Um, I'm just on a recorded uh, Teams call, okay? So no swearing. No swearing, no. <laughs> 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 Right, well, we're going to wrap up with some quick-fire questions. I don't know how quick-fire there will be uh, to get through them, but um, we, yeah, just, but we did forewarn you with these, so um, hopefully you might have a chance to give them some consideration. Okay. Um, but it might help some people out there um, as a result of, of your knowledge. We'll get through them as fast as we can. Okay. So number one... What do you wish you knew before you started in your industry? As in, your hindsight could be somebody else's foresight that's listening to. I kept, kept reading this and thinking, I've, I, I think, I think I've just taken. There's, there's, there's nothing that springs to mind, to be honest. Really? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've just kind of always tried to have. Well, not as a young person, not really maybe looking too much towards the future because I didn't. No, for instance, as a paint spray, like initially I wanted to be a technical rep, or, no. or when I was a technical rep, like I wanted to be a body shop manager. Or, um, well, what advice would you give to somebody starting out in where you were? Just work, work hard and yeah. uh, enjoy it. And you know, I think take one step at a time, really. Yeah, um, because yeah, if you just 
maybe sometimes don't don't get too far ahead of yourself. Um, I think probably if I'd have known back in the day that I needed to get into body shop management quicker than I did to actually do the type of job I do now, then I'd have probably done that a bit yeah. quicker, to be honest with you. But no, I don't, I don't, there are, haven't been many sort of those in my career. I've had a few major done a couple of times, which wasn't great. No. Yeah, uh, you, know, you just bounce back. So yeah, I just yeah. try and I think I've just tried to sort of uh, take it one step at a time, to be honest with you. Okay. And we, we've already mentioned this word earlier on, uh, but what have you failed and how did you overcome it? Because I'm a big advocate of the fact that you never fail, you just learn. And there's a lot of people perhaps out there that um, are, are afraid of failing. So it's always good to speak to somebody and let them tell their experience of, of when they are. And I'm sure you'd share yeah. the, same, the same view. Yeah, I remember one particular incident when I was at Toyota and we were launching a part of our program to a load of dealers and body shops at Dartford. The Hilton at the I still get the shivers every time I go past <laughs> this place. And uh, anyway, I got there on the Sunday night and I didn't, still hadn't got the presentation. So I had no time to rehearse it. And I had the flu. I felt terrible. And the presentation came through at about two o'clock in the morning. And uh, I got about four hours kit and literally read it the next day. And it was death by PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, it was hideous, really. And I spoke to my then boss and said, look, I really don't feel like doing this. And and also, I'm not rehearsed. And it was like, uh, tough, you know, you're doing it. And, uh, yeah, I wished, I wished I'd have said, no, I'm not doing it, to be honest with you, because I felt deeply embarrassed. I was just standing up there through a stinking cold flu type thing, yeah. hanging myself um, by attempting to do this presentation. I got yeah. to, you know, fail to prepare, prepare to fail. But, yeah, I, I like to be really organised. Yeah, uh, no. Yes. You'll never see me doing a presentation again from that moment onwards if if I've not had time to prepare for that's, it. That's, that's, a, that's a really great point because how many times do we find ourselves in instances where maybe we feel underprepared for something yeah, yeah. and we still continue through with it? And, it, you know, we have this fear of, of either letting the people down that we're there for. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a really, really good piece of advice. It's, it's having that strength of character to, to be able to say, no, this, is, this isn't mm -hmm. right. And for you to take a step back and come away. So thanks, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, can you give us a recommended resource that you could point listeners to? Yeah, I've made a note of two actually. Um, two, so really? yeah, there's um, a product called Red Mailer. So to any body shops listening out there, yeah, um, that are really focused on the customer journey and giving the customer brand experience. They should um, check out a guy called Martin Kelly, or maybe on LinkedIn. And um, Martin's got this fantastic product called Red Mailer. And I always feel I'm doing it a disservice when I talk about it. But it's like a branded communication tool between a dealer and a body shop and a customer. And, yeah, without, again, doing it a disservice, I would any manufacturer-approved body shop that's really, really focused on giving the customer a fantastic experience, branded experience, then uh, they should have a look at Red Mailer. And uh, there's another uh, product called Small, or company called Small Talk, T-O-R-Q-U-E, um, it's run by a guy called Gary Chu. Uh, he's a young guy, but they help body shops with social media. And they have a fantastic package. A lot of our body shops have signed up uh, for it and are being helped to enable them to promote their body shop across social media, uh, the website. Yeah. So you know, this, Gary's a real expert in that field. And the, the problem is a lot of body shops, they don't really have the time, the know-how, yeah. the expertise themselves to... They know they want to promote their business, but they need someone like Gary to come in. So, yeah, Small Talk, Gary Chew, Red Mail and Martin Kelly, two brilliant products. Highly yeah, great. We'll um, put those links to their uh, appropriate places within the uh, body of the uh, other podcast as yeah. well so people can, uh, can find them. Yeah. Are there any myths about your industry that you wish to debug? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, not... All garages look like Kevin Webster's autos or Grant and Phil Mitchell's garage. Um, you know, if you drive past a Volvo dealer, a Mercedes dealer, BMW dealer, Toyota dealer, whatever it might be, you know, they're nice big glass houses. And actually, what sits behind them in the workshops, in the work, in the body shop or the tent, the service department, is nothing like you see. And I think. Um, a lot of kids and parents have that perception that 
that's what it looks like. That's what it is, it's a greasy old job. And, um, you know, most workshops these days, you could go and eat your dinner off the floor, couldn't you? Yeah. So, yeah. Think, yeah. You know, again, yeah. I hope the school of thought, doing a bit of work with auto raise as well. We have a, an apprentice program and uh, we do our best to make sure that uh, we're raising the profile of the industry to attract more young people um, into it. And, yeah, sadly, I think a lot of people's perception is <laughs> – Mitchell Autos or whatever it's called, and uh, yeah. Kevin Winster Autos. No, so, yeah, it's it's a it's a myth. There are garages like that still, of course there are, but yeah, um, most of them are not like that. It's a really valid point, and 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 to be fair, for those people abroad who who uh, don't know what Webster's Autos is and Phil Mitchell Autos, they are uh, garages in in soap operas in the UK, of which a lot of people who watch and will get you know fed to them as a subconsciously that that's what garages are like. Um, yeah. And I think that's a really excellent, um, an excellent point to make because yeah, well, you know, when I started in a trade, a lot of garages, body shops were like it. I've worked in a couple of places that were a bit rough and ready, but yeah, professional body shops, garages, dealers, whatever, you don't don't really um, see that. Um, no, that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, nearly there. If you were in my shoes, what question would you have asked yourself that I didn't? I think you've done a great job. No, I can't think of anything. <laughs> You will go far, my friend. Um, can you give us a favourite driving track? Now, this is going to be something new for the Vehicle Network um, in the sense that we'll create a playlist of all the guests that have been on um, on Spotify. So if people are stuck driving around the country to those presentations and in there, you know, and sending their messages out on a wet, cold February Tuesday evening, what can they, what can they put on um, to, to ease that journey? And this will be the Vehicle Network podcast. So... Right. You well, the, first. I'm going to have to revisit the first two, but um, whether it's somebody from Autograph, I don't know. But if you definitely if you, not Steve Plunkett, and <laughs> if you've Steve got a Plunkett. driving track, I will start to compile. Well, check check it out by all means, but it's not for me. Like I said, <laughs> I think uh, there's so much music I could sort of throw you away, but I think uh, songs of faith and Devo devotion live by Depeche Mode. That album is incredible. Yeah, that's a great, that's great call, yeah. album to listen to in the car. You know, yeah. get it really, really loud. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned about the stadium announcement at King's Inn. So um, I'm still playing CDs there at the moment because of the technology that I have to use. Luckily, I've still got hundreds of CDs, and yeah. um, thankfully I didn't get rid of them in lockdown like I was planning to. Um, but And I've bought a few more just to make sure, try and keep the music fresh at, uh, at the walks on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. I went on the Tuesday night playing circa about 37, 40 songs every game. Yeah. And um, sort of write a right mix in there. But I actually always transfer the playlists onto Spotify. All right, okay. If anyone wants to go on Spotify and just check me out, yeah. and you can find the sort of stuff that I'm playing um, on there. But yeah, Songs of Faith and Devotion to Pesh Mode, an incredible album. I saw them in 1993, 94. A Crystal Palace Bowl on that tour, and just just amazing, incredible, yeah. Yeah. very very uplifting. Yeah, well, people that know me personally know that I do do a lot of DJing, and my sort of music genre is is um, house and dance music. But is it? Um, okay. yeah, there's there's a lot of remixes of um, Depeche Mode stuff that I play as well. So they're yeah, um, yeah they're a great great group, and um, thanks for giving us the inaugural. Um, direction of where this podcast may go to give listeners some music to listen to no problem and finally if people do want to find you online are you active um yeah. where can they find you on what platforms are you are you most active on um facebook linkedin instagram twitter i'm on all of them you're on them um, all i do like do like linkedin i think it's a great platform great yeah. tool to use for yeah like you and i know we quite often communicate on yeah. there yeah. And, uh, you know, I look at it daily and uh, I think it's really, really good. Yeah. Good yeah. connecting with business people and, you know, finding connections that maybe you wouldn't have previously thought of, you know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I use it a lot. I think it's really yeah. good. Yeah. 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 From a football and so personal stuff, like, not really such a big fan on Instagram, but no. it's more for the kids, I think. But yeah. um, Facebook and Twitter for the football banter, et cetera, is good. Great stuff. Well, thank you for being on uh, the Vehicle Network podcast and um, hopefully we will um, 
get to meet in person at some point soon. I think we might yeah. have an event yeah. next year that we're going to support you with, if that's... Um, yeah, just... well, we... No, it's an absolute pleasure, Now It's really, like I said, it's really... I really appreciate the connection. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, like we've had since we met at that um, talk that I gave in all yeah. those years ago. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I've got you down to come and talk at a presentation we're giving to insurers in March, haven't I? That's right, yeah. Insurer Technology Day. And again, I thought it'd be good, rather than just preach, preach, preach technology, I thought it'd be good yeah. uh, to get someone like you along to talk about uh, what you do. And I remember that Volvo that you showed me all those years ago that your colleague was in. Yeah. Um, yeah. You yeah. Know, but he uh, thankfully walked away um, alive from that. Yeah. 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 Horrendous, you know. And uh, maybe if that car had been repaired previously poorly, Maybe, maybe, maybe he might not have been lucky enough to walk out of that vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's really nice to see you again, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. No, thanks for coming on. We um, we appreciate it, and I'm sure some of the, some of the listeners will get um, a lot of information and uh, knowledge out of what you've had to say, Steve. Well, let's hope so. Yep. Okay. Thanking you. Yeah. We'll um, see you again soon. Yeah. Take care. All the best. Thank you. Thanks.